Good evening and welcome. This evening, uh, we will be having a debate about did Jesus have two natures? And I'm Tracy with KOGmissions.com and I will be the moderator for you. Samuel Nason will take the pro side and Carlos Xavier will be on the con side. We will be using the following format today. Each debater will have 10 minutes for his opening statement, then 25 for each uh, debater to have a cross-examination or rebuttal, however he chooses. And after that, each will have five minutes for a closing statement. Then we will end with 15 minutes of questions from the audience. And if you are in the live audience, as we get closer to the end, please type out all your questions in all caps. It helps us to see the questions when we're scrolling through. And please do write to whom it is addressed, whether it's Samuel or Carlos. And we will try to get to as many questions as time permits. If you're asking a lot of questions, pick your best one, because if there's a lot, we'll only be taking uh, one question from each person to make sure we, everyone gets a chance there. So this evening, Samuel Nason will be presenting his opening statement first. Samuel is the president of Explain International, an apologetic ministry that operates in Malaysia, US, Kenya, and Fiji. He has a THM in apologetics from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary and a Master of Christian Studies at Seminari Theology, Malaysia. He is also an adjunct lecturer for Malaysia Baptist Theological Seminary, where he oversees the apologetics program while pursuing his PhD in apologetics at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. So welcome, Samuel. Glad to Thank have you. you back with us. It's a joy to be with you. Thanks so much uh, for moderating this, Tracy. You're welcome. and. Uh, when I jump off, you can begin your opening statement. When you're ready, I'll pull up your PowerPoint, and then I will put a two-minute warning on the screen to let you know how much time is left, and then I'll be back on after that time runs out. That works for me. All right. All right. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are. It's a joy to be uh, even though virtually be able to tackle this question, did Jesus have two natures? I'd like to greet all of you in the name of our, in the words of Paul, great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I want to thank uh, Carlos for inviting and reaching out to me to do this. And I think it's an important topic and I'm really grateful to him for both uh, the invitation and uh, the uh, opportunity to engage with him on our differences. I'm also thankful to Tracy and uh, to all who have helped put this debate together. The question before us is, does Jesus, uh, does Jesus have two natures? And it boils down, I would argue, to one question, uh, or at least two questions. The first being, can God become flesh? Well, John chapter 1 verse 14 indicates that he can. It also means that when we ask the question of whether God can become flesh, we're asking whether God can be, quote, born in the likeness of man, as Philippians 2.7 describes it, or whether God can be sent, quote, in the likeness of sinful flesh, end quote, Romans 8, verse 3. So if the answer is yes, which scripture teaches, then the next question we'll need to look at is how would that look like? What would it look like to see God becoming man? Would that mean that he loses his deity? To embrace humanity? Uh, well, some people thought so. Uh, the kenotic uh, theory, which has been condemned as a heresy, certainly believed that. Uh, would that mean that uh, Jesus uh, or God would have to mix humanity into his divine nature? And again, many people in church history believe that. We call them the monophysites. Um, and uh, Apollinarius uh, is just one of the many uh, who would fall into that view? Or would it be that he would have to assume humanity while retaining his deity? And that's what Christians throughout the ages have always believed. Now, it's important to point out that this is where, the, this is the focus of the debate. If you want to look at where the debate is going, the question it boils down to is, can God become man? And Carlos believes that that cannot be the case, uh, as he will tell you. And if, if I've misrepresented him, I really uh, want would love for him to correct me on that. Uh, Carlos believes that God cannot become man, contrary to what the scripture teaches. Uh, and hence, he is forced to reject all three possibilities in section 
to, which how, how would that look like? Uh, he would reject, uh, he'd been also consistent with rejecting that he's also going to have to reject all of the explicit passages of scripture that call the man, Christ Jesus, God. He would have to do that in one of two ways. He would have to do that either by claiming that the text is ambiguous, uh, and often citing scholars that will tell you that you can't know what the plain meaning of scripture is, or he would have to do that by demonstrating that uh, or outright altering the plain meaning of the text so that it actually looks as if it says the exact opposite of what anyone reading it at face value would take it to mean. Uh, and so if, unlike Carlos, I would say that as someone who accepts what all of scripture says, I don't have that problem. I can look at where scripture calls Jesus our great God and Savior and just take that to mean uh, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, and I think that that's what you should be doing as well. But back to the topic at hand, which is, does Jesus possess two natures? I want to offer one argument, and this will be done in four premises. And I want to define our terms before we begin. When I say nature, I'm talking about what an object is. The term nature as used in the discussion of the early church fathers comes from the Greek word usia uh, or the Latin essentia or substantia, uh, which is where you get the word substance, essence, uh, and nature. Uh, they mean the same thing as far as I'm concerned in the debate today. We're not going to focus on something outside the scope of the two natures of Christ. Number two, when I talk about the divine nature, what I'm talking about is what God is in his one undivided essence, uh, which is you know, we commonly referred to as God's attributes, his omnipotence, his uh, being all present, those are part and parcel of God's divine nature. And when I talk about human nature, what I'm essentially talking about is what makes a human being human. I'm talking about the body-soul composite uh, with corresponding capacities such as will, mind, and so forth. And so these are the key terms that is important to define beforehand, and I hope that Carlos and I agree on these definitions as we go on. So now to my only argument as to why Jesus possesses two natures. Number one, premise one, God possesses a divine nature. We see that plainly uh, in the text of scriptures in passages such as Romans chapter 1 verse 20, which tells us quote, his divine, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived, uh, end quote. So God has a divine nature and it's not just that he has it, it's been perceived by humanity ever since the creation of the world because God has revealed that divine nature to us. Uh, in 2 Peter 1 verse 4, uh, the apostle Peter tells us that we may become, quote, partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire, end quote. So how do we become partakers of the divine nature? Well, Paul tells us that we do that in Romans chapter 8 by being in Christ. And so we'll explore the implications of that hopefully in the rebuttals or the cross-examinations. But the point is, and I don't think Carlos would disagree to this, that God possesses a divine nature. Uh, premise two, humans possess a human nature. Now, I think this is uh, just taken to be true, whether you go to the philosophers or whether you go to the scriptures, there is no explicit biblical testimony that says that humans possess a human nature, but we're essentially talking about the sum total of what a human is. And the Bible tells us, for example, describing what it means to be a human, that uh, God has, quote, made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor, end quote. So there are plenty of descriptions in the Bible that tell us what the human nature is and what the human nature is not. Premise three, Jesus is truly God. Now, this is where Carlos and I are going to be disagreeing. And I think this is probably the biggest point that we disagree on in my entire four premises. And that is Jesus is truly God. Now we can approach this um, in just looking through the plain passages of scriptures like John 20, 28, where Thomas calls Jesus my Lord and my God. Or you can look at it uh, in uh, Titus 2, 13, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. By the way, I didn't highlight all of this. I'm not sure how they suddenly appear to be all highlighted. I only highlighted the place where Jesus is called God. Second Peter 1, 1, Peter calls Jesus our God and Savior, Jesus Christ in Jude 1.5, uh, Jude tells us that he wants to remind us, although we once 
fully knew it, quote, that Jesus who saved a people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe, end quote. And so Jesus is the one who saved the people out of Egypt in the place where Exodus tells us that Yahweh, the God of Israel, saved them out of Egypt. So we can take the plain passages of scripture, face value, explicit, to mean that Jesus is truly God. But I do want, because the topic is on the dual nature of Christ, I do want to go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 8, and show how God, in choosing to uh, condescend to his creation, took on the human nature. You know, the Bible tells us that, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, and even death on a cross. And so God took on, even though Christ did not count equality with God something to be grasped, he emptied himself, and right after that, you come to the face in green, which is he is born in the likeness of men. Which comes first? Does Christ be born in the likeness of man first, or does he not consider equality with God something to be grasped? Well, his humility precedes logically his being born, which means that Jesus being born in the likeness of man is the act of humility that Paul describes here. And so therefore, Jesus is truly God. Premise four, Jesus is truly human. We don't have enough time to get to this, but scripture plainly tells us there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man. Christ Jesus. And so when you put all of this together, God possesses a divine nature. Humans possess a human nature. Jesus is truly God. Jesus is truly human. It follows, therefore, necessarily and inevitably that Jesus possesses two natures. That's the scope for today's debate, and I want to stick to that. And uh, let me just see how many seconds that I have uh, left. Uh, well, 15 seconds. In the last 15 seconds, let me just quote Hebrews 1.3, uh, which says that Jesus, quote, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power after making purification for our sins. End quote. Colossians 2.9 says, for in him, the person of Christ Jesus, the fullness of God, or the fullness of deity, dwells bodily. And we'll explore what that means later. Uh, thank you. I pass the time back to our moderator, Tracy. Thank you, Samuel. And next up, uh, Carlos will have his opening statement. Carlos Xavier grew up agnostic before converting to the non-Trinitarian Christian point of view in 2006. He lives with his wife in Fayetteville, Georgia, and currently works for Restoration Fellowship as the online media manager. He has hosted notable evangelical authors like J.R. Daniel Kirk, Larry Hurtado, and historian Richard Rubinstein, and debated apologists like Dr. Jonathan McClatchy, Al Garza, and Anthony Rogers, as well as Matt Slick. So welcome, Carlos. Good evening. Thank you, Tracy, for moderating, and thank you, Sam, for getting up early there in Malaysia. <laughs> you are very welcome. And... Carlos, uh, you may begin once I jump off when you're ready. All righty, thank you. I will present the following three points to show why Jesus did not have two natures. One, the New Testament describes the origin of the Son via procreation. Two, the New Testament describes the death of the Son of God. And three, the so-called two natures of Christ is a post-biblical, in other words, non-biblical doctrine. First, the New Testament writers did not believe a pre-existent, quote, God the Son, second person of a so-called Trinity God, entered Mary's womb in order to take on, assume human flesh or nature. Instead, the New Testament writers describe the origin, Genesis, Matthew 1, verse 1, of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. In verse 18, Matthew describes how the origin of Jesus came about. And in verse 20, the angel of the Lord says that the child begotten, that is procreated in her womb, is from the Holy Spirit. In other words, a miracle by God. 
Similar language is used by the angel Gabriel in Luke chapter 1 when he says to Mary, you will conceive and give birth to a son. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For this reason, the child will be the Son of God. The Son's origin, coming into being, into existence, happened here for the very first time, and we all know human beings do not pre-exist their birth. The words of the angel are a fulfillment of famous Old Testament prophecies like Psalm 2 verse 7, where God says in a prophecy, you are my son, today I have begotten you, that is, I have become your father. Psalm 110 verse 3, where the Septuagint, or the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, I have begotten you from the womb before the morning star. John, in his gospel, consistently refers to Jesus as the only begotten, that is, procreated Son of God. This has been the traditional rendering of the Greek compound word monogenes, from the Greek monos, only one, and yenis from the Greek yenao. The latter is used throughout the genealogies of both Old and New Testaments to refer to fathers begetting or procreating children. According to Ralph's commentary of Genesis, the word yenao means to cause something to come into existence primarily through procreation. This explains why the son says in John 6 verse 57, as the living father sent me, and I live because of the living father. The apostle Paul believed the same when he says in Galatians 4 verse 4, God sent forth his son made of a woman. The Greek translated as made is from the verb yinome, which according to Bauer's lexicon means to come into being, existence through the process of birth. Fair's lexicon, to become, that is, to come into existence, begin to be, receive being. So for Paul, the son comes into being inside, not outside his mother's womb, as the two natures doctrine would have you believe. This is exactly the same as when Matthew and Luke describe the procreation of the son by miracle in the womb of Mary. The IVP Bible background commentary is right to note that what we find in Matthew and Luke is not the story of a divine being, that is a God the Son, descending to earth in the guise of a man, but rather the story of a miraculous conception without aid of any man, divine or otherwise. Point number two, the Son died. In Romans 5.10, Paul says, once we were God's enemies, but we have been brought back to him because his son has died for us. Romans 8, 32, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Galatians 2, 20, the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In other words, the son of God died for Paul and by extension for all who believe he is the Messiah of God. Similarly, John 3, 16, 1 John 4, 10 says that God gave his only begotten son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Notice, these scriptures say the sacrificial work was done by the son himself who suffered and eventually died a horrible death as a sacrifice for our sins. The point is, there is nothing here to even suggest this happened to some impersonal human nature only. And however you want to define death, the Bible says God simply cannot do it. 1 Timothy 1.17 Now to the King Eternal, Immortal, Invisible, the only God. And as a matter of historical fact, the idea of a suffering and dying God was first introduced by some of these so-called church fathers as early as the second century AD. Bishop Melito of Sardis believed the God has been murdered. The King of Israel has been put to death by an Israelite right hand. This type of 
rhetoric inevitably led to the anti-Semitism of other so-called early church fathers and later Protestant reformers. For example, in his sermons, John Calvin repeatedly called the Jews profane, unholy, sacrilegious dogs. And my last point, the so-called two natures doctrine is post-biblical and some well-known Trinitarians are very critical of this fact that has been ensconced in the creeds of mainstream modern-day Christianity. For example, the noted Scottish minister and scholar John McIntyre was right to say, the scriptures obviously do not think of Jesus Christ in dualistic terms, which in honesty we must admit is one of the first impressions created by the use of the two nature model. When Luke says in chapter 2 verse 52 that Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man, Luke does not say that it was in respect of his human nature. Even in the great prayer of John 17, when Jesus makes his awareness of his oneness with the Father unmistakably plain, John 17, 5, John 17, 10, and 21, there's not the slightest hint that one part of his person is speaking or that what he is saying might not be entirely true of his whole person. It was left to later apologetic to invent subtleties one might even say deceptions of this sort. The Catholic Roman theologian Thomas Hart noted that in Chalcedon and the theological development that flows from it, Jesus is called man in the generic sense, that is human, but not a man. He has a human nature, but is not a human person. The person in him is the second person of the Blessed Trinity. Jesus does not have a human personal center. This is how the council at Chalcedon gets around the possible problem of a split personality. Therefore, adds Hart, the Chalcedonian formula, that is, Jesus is truly God and truly man, makes a genuine humanity impossible. The Protestant historian Bishop A.T. Hansen made the following admission. During my theological formation, I was well instructed in the traditional account of the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ. I distinctly remember being told that the Word of God, when He assumed human nature, assumed impersonal humanity, that Jesus Christ did not possess a human personality, that God became man in Jesus Christ, but that He did not become a man. In other words, what these Trinitarian bishops, scholars, and historians are telling you is that the two natures doctrine results in a Jesus who was never even a man, that is, a human person. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks, Carlos, for uh, your opening. So uh, I want Are to get you... Uh, <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. And so I want to, uh, I want to actually uh, tackle... Because I, when I, when I heard your opening statement, I, nothing you said actually engaged uh, with uh, my opening statement at all. So, and and again, it's not meant to. It's your opening at all. It's your opening statement. So, but the point that I want to maintain is this: in my opening statement, I presented. Uh, let me pull up my my notes again so that I can quote exactly what I said. Uh, I presented one argument that Jesus possessed two natures. I possessed. I presented the fact that God possesses a divine nature. Humans possess a human nature. Jesus is truly God. Jesus is truly human, and therefore, Jesus uh, possesses two natures. Now, it seems to me that everything you said in your opening statement uh, just at, uh, deals with the part of Jesus's human nature. Is that right? I don't not quite understand the question. The question is, when you talked about the Son having a beginning, any Trinitarian who believes in the two natures affirms that the Son had a beginning. Is that not right? As, as far as I've read and understood through my years of research and debating, uh, the Son does not have an origin, does, does not have a beginning, does not come into being as Matthew and Luke record. That's my understanding of... So, 
Trinity. Yeah. Turner. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you. Please finish. Finish. Please no. finish, Carlos. No, I'm finished. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I want to say that uh, you, you do realize because I'm I'm a little bit put back because I thought that this would be plain information. So uh, we, we do believe that the human nature of Christ had a beginning, right? I mean, you, we do. We do concede that we believe the human nature of Christ is a created nature that came into existence uh, through the virgin birth. Uh, and that you, you recognize that we believe that, right? I, yes, I recognize that the, the two natures of Christ or the hypostatic union is prefaced uh, on the idea, on the Chalcedonian idea, which came, by the way, more than 400 years after Christ, that uh, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, uh, added or assumed or took on, I read different variations of that, uh, human nature. But the point of my opening, in case it was not clear, is that I'm relying on Matthew, who talks about the origin of Jesus, the Messiah, period not the origin oh, yes. of a human nature. And I'm relying on Luke's account that specifically uses sun language to talk about how the sun yes. comes into being. Right. So here's the thing. Uh, I mean, so you, you, you would be, would you, would you help us explain your understanding of the communicatio idiomatum? No. Uh, do, do you, could you define what the communicatio idiomatum is? Uh, as far as I know, it's that something about the two natures do not mix or not together, but I can't give you a, you know, sort of, yeah, so I'm, not like defending, a, I'm not defending that, so I can't give you a definition. No, I, I realize that, Carlos, but the thing is, I do believe that in order to uh, engage with, for example, what we believe concerning the person of Jesus Christ, um, and especially when you say that he is born, uh, a, a basic understanding of the communicatio idiomatum would basically settle that. So I would like to maybe ask if that could pull up my slides uh, again. Uh, Tracy, sure. is that possible? Uh, all right, thanks so much, Tracy. Yeah, okay. So uh, the communicatio idiomatum simply means that, and I'm, this is the second point, what is true of each nature is true of the one person in that the word united himself with a complete humanity. And this was dealing with the question that you asked me last night for me, uh, which is did Jesus assume a humanity uh, or did Jesus assume a uh, body or both? I, I presume you're talking about the controversy between the Antiochian uh, and uh, Alexandrian Christology. Uh, but the point is that what we believe here is that Jesus, the one person of Jesus, who is divine, who was divine, took on the human nature. I'm going to give the biblical references in just a minute. And when he takes on the human nature, both of these, the, key communicate, the communication of the attributes takes place so that both of these natures become, whatever is true of each of these natures, are true of the one person. In other words, is it right to say that Jesus was born? Is it right to say that Jesus was born of the, the Virgin Mary? Yes, it is. That's what the communicatio idiomatum is. And so I will cite uh, Ignatius of Antioch, um, who says, quote, from Mary and from God, first passable, then impassable, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we're not saying the human nature came from Mary and from God. We are saying that the person of Jesus Christ came from Mary and from God. Does that mean that Jesus is timeless? Oh, yes, it is. Does that mean that Jesus had a beginning in time? We're talking about the human nature. And in that sense, the one person that being communicated to the person of Christ, yes, Jesus took on flesh. And that meant taking the form of a servant at a particular point of time in history. That's what uh, the communicatio idiomatum is. Or to quote the Tertullian, quote, uh, the, thus the two natures, the, the, thus the nature of the two substances displayed him as man and God. In one respect, born, in the other, unborn. In one respect, fleshly. In the other, spiritual. And and I and in one respect, okay. I, I, for some reason, I can't see that uh, it's blocked out. Uh, in the other, exceedingly strong. In one sense, dying. In the other, living. And so this is Tertullian on the flesh. He was responding to Martian, the Martian heresy. And so my point is, Carlos, and maybe I just, I'll phrase this in the form of a question because this is both rebuttal 
and cross-examination. Uh, when you understand that, uh, and when you understand that the both natures are communicated to the person, the one person of Jesus Christ, uh, do you not fail to understand why every single one of your objections actually just, just disappears? It doesn't affect it at all. Because we do believe that that's something not that came in Nicaea. That's something that Ignatius of Antioch, who is a disciple of the Apostle John, is saying. Um, all I can tell you is what Matthew and Luke say, and they uh, say nothing close to what you're what you have on the screen. Now, these are quotes again from people who are not firsthand witnesses. Who are this is all extra biblical stuff, post biblical stuff, yes, which doesn't right. necessarily mean it's wrong, but yes. obviously we have to test it in light of scripture. So, all I could say to the uh, communication properties, uh, it's a it's it's amusing to me, and I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but it's amusing sure. when you keep saying how simple it is and how clear it is. Well, mm -hmm. it's not simple. First of all, anyone reading what you have on the screen is, is, is not simple. Uh, the Ignatius quote is interesting. So he's first passable, then impassable. So he has a beginning and he does not have a beginning. He is uh, some... But, but uh, not to cite... Sorry, sorry, Carlos, I'm going to... Because I think we're sidetracking here. Uh, the question that I asked, just to repeat that again, uh, is do you not see why this would... In, this is essentially what we believe, and it doesn't even come to the Council of Nicaea. This is actually early Christology directly from the fathers that come from post-apostolic period. This is what they already teach. It's not me misunderstanding... Uh, you know, what the translations are saying, not realizing the culture in Greek or Hebrew, uh, but rather this is just what the Christians have always believed. And even those who are acquainted with the apostles, you're right, it is unbiblical tradition, I mean, extra biblical tradition, but this is what we're saying. And my point is, whatever you said about God dying, God being immortal, whatever you said about God having a beginning, uh, or, or rather Jesus having a origin, Ganao, uh, well, uh, the 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 uh, the genealogy part in Genesis in Matthew one one, all that is resolved. It's a non-issue, right? That's, I was just asking whether you, you recognize why it's a non-issue in light of I this. Think, I think you're overstating the historical aspect of Christianity as a whole. There's a reason why there were hundreds of councils in the first 300, 400 years of the Christian faith. There's a reason why there was so much violence, murder, and, and mayhem between so-called Christians. The, you know, so you, I think you're overstating your case when you say, this has been what we have always believed since we call ourselves Christians. Well, that's just historically inaccurate, but, and it's wrong. That, that's not but, the but case. That's not my question. But that's not my question, no. Carlos. I would appreciate it for no, the third I'm, time. I'm, I'm trying to get to the same to question. The, I'm responding to the overstatement of your generalized generalization of early M Christianity. Maybe. Uh, again, Carlos, with all due respect, you can respond to that. Uh, if there's something you disagree with the way I overstated it, you have a rebuttal period to deal with that. Uh, I just, because I've, I'm short on time, I just want to get you to, to say that, do you realize that everything you said is just resolved by the communication idiomatum? It's as simple as that. It's, it's just a simple yes, no question, because I just well, want to ensure to help. I want to just, I just one second, I just want to help our viewers who are listening to this realize that every single one of your objection uh, just doesn't work because of a very simple thing that, and my point is not that, uh, I'm, I, I, if you if you want to argue that it's an overstatement, that's fine. You can do that in the rebuttal. My point is this, it is not something post-Nicaea. It's something we find in the earliest period of the apostolic times. And not to say that makes it true. I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is something that we have from the earliest times, if just taken at what they mean, resolves what you brought up. Do you or do you not realize that is what I'm trying to get at. Right, and I keep going back to what Matthew and Luke have to say, and for people to read the words of Matthew and Luke. So and what does Matthew them, say? Uh, if you could summarize in one sentence, Carlos, what does Matthew and Luke say? And compare them to what you have on the screen. So Matthew talks about the origin of Jesus the Messiah, period. He doesn't so say, do, this is the, can I finish? Go, yes, please. Yes, please. Sorry. So Matthew is not saying this is the origin of the human nature. Luke similarly, and Luke uses specific son language telling us that the child 
in, in Mary's womb will be the son of God. So again, they have nothing uh, comparable to what you have on the screen and what, what you have been taught. It, it only speaks in terms of the one individual, one person, son of God, Jesus the Messiah, his origin, Genesis, one beginning, one absolute beginning, and his how he comes into being in the womb of Mary. That right. is the Son of God, according to Luke. Yes. So do you, do you think that we believe, again, I think I'm trying to help our viewers realize that essentially whatever you're saying, we don't disagree with. Uh, is, is the point. If you're, if you're listening to these guys and you're wondering why I keep pressing Carlos on this point, it's because, I, I, I mean, Carlos is going to have his entire time uh, in the rebuttal to respond to what he perceives to be an overstatement from me uh, and all that. But I want you to, to realize that nothing of what he's saying, we fully agree. You, Carlos, you just said that nothing uh, you, that is stated in Matthew and in Luke, uh, you know, for example, correspond to what I'm saying here. My point is this, the okay, let's just look at Tertullian, simple one statement. Tertullian says that the two natures of the substance displayed in him as man and God, him as one person, in one respect born, in the other unborn. Do we believe that the person of Jesus, the person, not human nature, not divine nature, the person, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ was born. Do we believe that, Carlos? Yes or no? I believe what Matthew and Luke believe, that he had a genesis. Uh, Carlos, I'm not, his, Carlos, I'm no, sorry. No, I have to press you. Carlos, I'm mean, so sorry. Carlos, well, I'm so I sorry. Answer? You asked me a no, question. You're not, you're not, okay. I, I've, asked, I've asked you a very simple, Carlos, I'm trying not, I'm not, I don't want to interrupt you at all, but I want you to answer my question. My question is, is do we believe that the person of Jesus, that is not the human nature, divine nature distinction, the person of Jesus, do we believe? Does Tertullian believe that Jesus, the person, was born? Yes or no? Matthew talks about the beginning, the origin, not just the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Right. That's what Matthew says. Luke again talks specifically about the Son that will be procreated in the womb by a miracle. Right. So okay. that is not Ignatius. Ignatius is talking about something or someone who is passable, then impassable. You just said born and unborn. That's not in one language. It's in one respect <laughs> born, in one respect unborn. Now, let me go. To, you said there's no scriptural uh, reference. Unborn, unborn so is it, nonsense language. Can you agree it, with me? Uh, could you repeat that again, Carlos, please? You said that you. You're interpreting Ignatius, passable mm -hmm. then impassable, as someone who is born and unborn. Yes. I'm saying that's nonsensical. Can we agree on that? Uh, I would say that you can ask me that during the cross-examination, but I would just respond to that by saying just because you do not understand something does not make it wrong. In fact, however, despite you not understanding something, if scripture says it, that automatically makes it true. So just because Carlos doesn't understand it, doesn't mean it's wrong or nonsensical. Well, it just means that Carlos, that Carlos, I'm. This is my time, Carlos. You got to respect that. So just because Carlos doesn't understand it, doesn't mean it's wrong, right? Just because Carlos doesn't get it, he can't fathom it. Doesn't mean it's nonsensical. I want to go back, you, Carlos. You said earlier that, uh, and these are great questions to ask me in the cross examination. So uh, now go, going back, you said there's no biblical basis for this. I want to go to Colossians chapter two, verse nine. In him, quote, the whole or the fullness of deity dwells bodily. And the Greek word there is uh, so, 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 somos. Uh, I, I need to get I need I need to get get my Greek back in order again. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's bodily. In him, the one person, Jesus, all of deity, that is all of the divine nature, dwells bodily. What does that mean? It means that God was in Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 19, Paul says that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. All right. Now, okay. the Greek word... Yep. Please, no, sorry, please go on, Carlos. Please go on. Now, the Greek word there in Colossians 2, 9 is a very specialized, if you will, technical word that Paul uses that is translated uh, invariably as the Godhead or God nature. So, but most translations simply have God. 
So God was in Christ. You have Ephesians uh, 3, uh, 19 as well. Uh, uh, Carlos, we, we're just talking about Colossians 2, 9, Carlos. I've got a little bit of time. Ask sure. you, what does that mean? Just in simple terms, Carlos, you can, I, I'll give you an opportunity to restate what you just said again, uh, but for the benefit, but please keep it short because I've got a follow up. Yeah, thank you for giving me the time. Uh, like I said, it, to me, it means what Paul means in other places, like 2 Corinthians 5.19, that God was in Christ, which means that if you see Jesus, you see the Father, God the okay. Father. All right. So I, I, it's, it's really interesting that you would say that. So do you, we as Christians, we believe that God is in us. Does that make us? Does it, is it fair then to say for in us, you and I, uh, oh well, for for a for for a, a person who believes in, uh, I mean, a genuine believer, sure. the fullness of deity dwells in a bodily form. Does that, is that what it says? Is that what it means? Because if that's the oh. case, then it's not unique of Jesus. It's true of Paul. It's true of uh, Peter. It's true of every single believer in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, but that's not what the text is teaching. This is a text that is uniquely applied to Jesus. In what way will this be a unique application to Jesus in a way that it is not applicable to us, Carlos? I agree that God was in Christ in a very unique way. I agree with that totally. But there is a sense where Paul also talks about born again believers, as temples for the Holy Spirit, right? We are temples of God's Holy Spirit. I mean, how much holier can you get? That's why we're called saints. We're called the elect. But I agree with you, Sam, that God was in Christ in a in a unique way, unlike us. That's I'm not saying God was in Christ, Carlos. I'm not saying God was in Christ. That's, well, not, that's, not, that's not what the text means. I'm quoting that's Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 19, which I think that's what he means in Colossians 2, 9. So. I, no, no, I, no, no, no. So I believe, okay, just to, okay, guys, I want, I want you guys to catch this. I believe everything that scripture says. I believe God was in Christ. Trinitarians believe that it's called perichoresis. It's the mutual indwelling of God. The Father is in the Son. The Son is in the Father. I don't deny that. But Colossians 2, 9, Carlos, for the sake of our viewers, to be clear, Colossians 2, 9 is not saying Theos, God, dwells in Jesus. That's not what it's saying. I believe God dwells in Jesus. It is saying, as you yourself said, it means divine nature. You said that. So the divine nature, which is the fullness of God, let's call it omnipotence, let's call it omni omniscience, all of that dwells bodily in the person of Jesus Christ. That's what the text is saying. And in that sense, it's not just a unique way, Carlos. Would you agree with me? It is saying that the person of Christ, while, I mean, bodily, he dwells bodily, in him, the fullness of deity, that is the divine nature dwells. If that is true, don't you recognize that's the two natures right there in front of you? No, it says nothing about Christ having two natures. In, it, in does, it not say, does it not say, does it not say he, so let's just, let's just establish what we agree on, Carlos. We agree when, that Jesus is human, right? God, when Paul says God was in Christ, that doesn't mean that Paul was saying Christ had two I, natures. I agree with you. I fully agree with you, Carlos. That's But we're not talking about Corinthians. You've got to stick to the text, Carlos. We're talking about Colossians <laughs> chapter 2, verse 9. We're not saying God was in Christ. The text does not say that. And this is why I said earlier to those of the, those of you watching, we're going, the difference between me and Carlos is this. I'm going to be able to just take this prima facie, face value, and tell you, I don't have to twist it in the name of context. I don't have to tell you it's ambiguous. I can just tell you, it says here, fullness of deity dwells bodily. And I want to get this now. I only got five minutes left, Carlos. Really quick, yes or no question. Do you agree that the phrase dwells bodily implies Jesus as a human nature? Yes or no? Again, I can only restate what I've said. Uh, elsewhere in Ephesians 3.19, Paul says, Carlos, I'm asking you about Carlos. I'm asking you about Colossians, Carlos. You're going all over the place. I'm, I need, I'm not, I don't want to interrupt you. I want you to deal with Colossians 2.9. I only have five minutes left. Yes, so I'm dealing back, with it with, with, with context that you don't like. No, not, not in the name of context. context. Just, Carlos, like, it's but, a simple question. It's a yes, no question. All right. So in yes, Ephesians no. 3.19, Paul says, Carlos, it's a so yes, no question. Mean, Carlos, so it's a yes, no, Carlos, the this, this is, of all the uh, I, I wish the moderator would step in at this point. 
uh, <laughs> I just wish the moderator would step in because this is not correct. I'm asking you. Okay, a yes, I will no step question. in here for a second. So, Carlos, he's asking about Colossians, but Samuel, he's trying to explain his point of view using scripture. And so, I guess we can either Under, stop at my, that my, point my, about Colossians or you guys decide how you want to uh, do it. My, my, my question is a yes, no question. Is this dealing with the day, the, 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 I mean, that, does Carlos agree that when it says dwells bodily, Jesus has a human nature? That's this Again, it, to me, I don't think for what it, he believes he can answer that in it, with that. Well, I'm trying to answer, okay. but I keep yeah. getting cut off. I answered it at first, but you don't like the answer. I believe what <laughs> Paul is saying here is that God was in Christ, and he says it in a similar way in other passages. And if I may finish the verse I'm trying to finish, sure, Ephesians 3.19 is a good parallel for people to study in connection to Colossians 2 9 because in Ephesians 3 verse 19 Paul also says he wants us Christians to be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God which is similar language that he uses here it is, it is not similar language at all and this is this is exactly why uh, I told all of you uh, at the start that Carlos is not going and again I don't blame Carlos for this he's doing the best that he can I'm just simply saying that when you don't allow strip you come with a tradition that God cannot become a man automatically you're going to have to reinterpret all of these texts to mean something that they don't mean uh, and I'm going because of we're not getting anywhere with the cross examination I'm just going to take my remaining 2 minutes uh to uh, as a rebuttal before I pass the time off to Carlos and this is this so I I, I want to some for viewers here I want to go back to my my five points here does God possess a divine nature yes I, there's nothing that Carlos has said so far that would deny that. Maybe Carlos is going to challenge that in his rebuttal period. Uh, I, it would only be fair to wait for him to do that. Uh, number two, uh, humans possess a human nature. This is taken for granted. Okay, we, we can take that for granted. That, that, that is the case. The Bible gives us descriptions about what the human nature looks like. Jesus is truly God. Carlos, uh, again, uh, would deny that. But uh, I would love for him in his time to deal with the passages that I brought up that explicitly teach Jesus is God. Not my interpretation explicitly teaches that finally jesus is truly human now i want to share for our viewers why was i pressing carlos just now really hard i was doing that because i want to at least as uh and by the way i i, I respect carlos uh and i and i love interacting with him but unfortunately he's not engaging with a simple question that's i mean so carlos is going to say colossians 2 9 is not teaching you that that, that the, the the two natures he's not now if you frame it that way sure it's not but if you accept what it says, that Jesus, uh, the fullness of God dwells bodily, which is what it says. Let's go to it. Dwells bodily. That's the human nature right there. You're talking about body. You're talking about, uh, the, you're talking about a human being. And on the one hand, you're talking about the divine nature. Now, I didn't use the word divine nature. Carlos did. He says that this can mean divine nature. That's simply what I'm saying. It talks about the human nature dwelling, fullness of the divine nature dwelling bodily in him one person and if you just allow the text to say plainly what it says you've got the two natures right there um let, let me rebut a little bit of the fullness of deity there so yes uh, ephesians 3 19 to know the love of christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled up you christian you may be filled up to all the fullness of deity the fullness of god i mean that's almost verbatim from Paul. And what that simply means is that the desire of both God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, is that we as Christians, like they as father and son, may be one. Now, this is obviously not to be taken in, in a too literal way. This is what you, know, what you may say is spiritual speaking. And a, a good passage to go for that is, the so-called high priestly prayer of Jesus in John 17. He says, I am not praying only on their behalf, but also on behalf of those who believe. In other words, people like us in the future, that they all be one. Just as you, Father, John 17, 21, are in me, I am in you. I pray, this is the Son, by the way, praying to the Father, who is the only true God in, in verse 5. 
I pray that they will be in us so that the world will believe that you send me and so on. I in them, verse 23, you in me, that they may be completely one. So that is the desire of our Lord Jesus, that we are one. In 1 John, uh, what is it? 1 John chapter 1, he talks about the same thing. Uh, uh, sorry, John, uh, he talks about how we are to have fellowship with both the Father and the Son. So First uh, John 1 verse 3, uh, it says that so that you may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father, with his Son, the Messiah. So I, I, I think uh, that is what Paul is talking about there. Um, let's see. So uh, at one point in your opening, you said, can God become flesh? And you said, yes, John 1, 14. Well, uh, again, this is not a, a, a debate on John 1, on the prologue of John, but John 1, 14 does not say God became flesh, like God, the, the only God. It's talking about how the word of God becomes flesh. The word of God. The word in the Old Testament is not a separate, distinct person apart from God. It's one of the qualities of God, the Father, of Yahweh, Jehovah, as is known in the Old Testament. So that's not saying God became flesh in a literal, strict, uh, so-called orthodox way, as Trinitarians believe. It's about God's plan, God's word, the, the eternal word of life, as Paul calls that in his own commentary in his first letter of John, the word of life, the one that started everything, that create all oh, the, what is it? The Psalms, the psalmist says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. That is what is coming into the world and taking up residence, if you will, in the one unique procreated human son of God, uh, the Messiah, Jesus. Uh, let's see, you said. Was that a question for me? Or not? Uh, not yet. Okay, <laughs> sure. No problem. I'm doing a, a bit of cleaning up here. Uh, no I, I appreciate, uh, by the way, Samuel, uh, you defining terms like nature. So, what you mean by nature, or what nature is meant in 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 the system you represent. So, you said nature is what an object is, but then you said divine nature is God in His nature. So. Let me ask you here the first question. How So how can Jesus be 100% God and 100% man, human, at the same time? Uh, that's a very simple one. Uh, and it's it's basically, it sums down to a mystery. I do not know. So when God speaks, uh, allow me to use an analogy. Uh, so when God speaks and the universe comes into being, how does that actually, that's a word, do that? I, I don't know. The scripture says it. I believe it. So the scriptures teach that Jesus is God. That was my basis for saying Jesus is God. The scriptures teach he is man. Um, and it teaches us that the fullness of God dwells in the person of Jesus Christ in bodily form. And so I'm just having Carlos to, to, to sincerely wrestle with what the scriptures say. And you'll know that I didn't stick to tradition as much as I stick to the text. So how is it that Jesus is truly God, truly man? Uh, well, God can take upon himself a human nature. He can willingly choose to enter into his own creation. That's why I put that as the main question at the starting point. Does that, does that, did I answer your question, Carlos? Uh, beautifully. So it's a Thank mystery. You. Yeah. So it's a mystery. Thank you. So let, let me go back again to Matthew's account. So Matthew, Matthew 1, 1, this is the origin uh, or record of origin. And again, uh, translations, most translations do not render the Greek here as origin, by the way. They have either birth or genealogy. But the Greek word is origin, it's genesis. So this is the origin of Jesus, the Messiah, verse 1. And then in verse 18, the same. Now, the origin of Jesus happened this way. Again, please, uh, I appeal to the Greek here, which is not, uh, in, in my humble estimation, is not being properly uh, rendered by most translations, but it is origin. So let me ask you, in light of that, what 
or who exactly originated had his or its beginning in the womb of Mary? What exactly or who? Right. So uh, I want to first, if, if that's okay with you, Carlos, just uh, say that I, I take, I differ with you on your understanding of the word uh, Genesis. Uh, and because uh, according to the New American Standard Bible, uh, well, uh, the uh, sorry, New American Standard Exhaustive Concordance, uh, uh, and it, it actually, the semantic range for Genesis is actually birth, genealogy, life, and natural. Uh, so that's that's the semantic range that it's 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 actually used as. So I would agree with the translators, uh, the, as you said, the majority of the translators in saying that in this context it is dealing not with the origin but a genealogy. And the reason I would agree with them, Carlos, is because right after the phrase Genesis, it is followed by who is the father of who, 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 and that is clearly not. It's clearly in this context, it is referring to a genealogy. Uh, but you did ask another question, who or what was or beginning, or what, what, could you rephrase that question again, Carlos? Because I don't think I did. What I or that. who had its beginning in Mary? What or who had its beginning or uh, in Mary? Yes, so what we believe is, as Philippians chapter 2 teaches, that in his willing submission, the son willingly took on the form of a servant being born in the likeness of man. And that is what took place in the womb of Mary. It was basically the incarnation, that is the logos, taking on carnes, uh, which is Latin for flesh. And that's that's exactly what I believe John 1 14 is teaching uh, that he's taking right. on his human nature by being born in the likeness of men. It so, is a, again, may I add one more thing, Carlos? And that is this is the choice, it is the voluntary decision of God to the Son to do that prior to actually being born. That, that, that's okay. all I wanted to add. So, yes. so a human nature uh, originated in the womb, is that what you're saying? But yes, I, I would say that he, I would say that, yeah, since Jesus has two natures, his human nature uh, is derived from Mary. Yes, that's why he's born of the virgin. The virgin birth is so important. Okay, so, so Mary gave birth to a human nature. Is that a fair assessment? No. In light no. of the idio idiomatum, I mean, I, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't disagree with that. I, I would, so I would just phrase it a little bit differently, Carlos, because the sure. moment you say the, and I'll tell you why I would phrase it differently, because the moment you say Mary gave birth to the, to a human nature, you're treating the nature as if it is a person. And as you pointed out, thanks for being so appreciative, by the way. Uh, as you pointed out, I took pains to distinguish between the subject of the nature that is the personhood. And so what we believe is, yes, uh, Mary did not give birth to a nature. She gave birth to a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. And as you know, the early church, okay, uh, I mean, the councils, they call him the Theotokos, the God. She's, she's right. the God bearer. Sorry, did, did, did I answer you? I hope I answered your question. Yeah, let that. me let me ask you about the word person. So yes. Mary gave birth to the person of Jesus. Yes. Okay. As, as far as I understand the uh, Chalcedonian system, and I'll, I'm going to put a chart up here from Grudem mm -hmm. Systematic Theology. Uh, right. which is, a, a, I guess, a standard, one of the standard models of Chalcedonian Christology. When, when you're talking about a person, so you have a person of Christ there, but you're also uh, speaking about the second person, God the Son, which is uh, the S there. So you have Father, Son, Holy Spirit in the solid circle. So you have the person of the Son, and then you just said the person of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So is that two persons? No, it's not two persons. And the reason it is not two persons. So do you want me to deal with, I want to make sure that I answer your question exactly. So are you asking me about the personhood or are you asking me about this diagram? I'm asking you, you just said the person of Jesus, Mary gave birth to. But you also yes. have the person, the second person of your Trinity. Yes. Okay. That sounds like two persons. No, it is not. So that, th okay. thanks for thanks for giving me the opportunity to clarify that. So the reason I do not believe in two persons is because scripture doesn't speak of two persons. It speaks of the man, singular, Jesus Christ. It speaks of person. Jesus uses the singular pronoun I. And so for that reason, 
uh, I believe, I mean, the scripture is clear in the early, uh, the, the Chalcedonian council uh, following from Ephesus fought hard to maintain that Jesus, contrary to Nestorianism, that Jesus actually was one person, not two persons. By the way, I want to also add uh, that uh, I'm not saying that Nestorians, Nestorians argued for two persons. That's an important point to do. Uh, I'm simply saying that's what it appeared to be. Sorry, side point. Uh, I don't want to get accused of that. Now, back to what you were saying, uh, the Grudem, Grudem, uh, Grudem uh, chart. I looked yeah. at Grudem's chart. Uh, it doesn't seem to me to be anything uh, other than what I would say. So I, I, I'm not sure that I would disagree with it. However, I've, maybe, I've, I've, I've hosted Dr. Grudem on my channel before, uh, and I've, 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 as you know, uh, done a video on his Christology. I do disagree uh, with some things of his Christology, namely his eternal functional subordination view. I don't hold to that. Uh, and I also realized that he's changed his views. Uh, on in starting to accept the eternal generation of the sun. And you see this in the first to the second right. edition. So I, I do not know which edition this is taken from. I'm just a bit cautious uh, on the Christology right. of Dr. Gruen. Okay, let me go back to something you just said about the I, the person, mm -hmm. the yes. ego. Um, mm -hmm. let, let me ask you this question about that just as a follow-up. Sure. Um, so whenever, whenever Jesus, whenever the son says I or me, mm -hmm. how do you know which nature he's speaking of? So for example, the, the classic one, Mark 13, 32, uh, if I may read it, but as for that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the son, only the father or, or the father except the father uh, mark has yeah, uh, matthew yeah. has only the father knows so yeah. whenever we see that from jesus when he says i know this or i don't know this how do you know which nature is is, is speaking no thank thanks so much for asking that question i want to i have a confession to make here uh, and that is that passage uh, as someone who used i mean who's someone who you know grew up believing in the Trinity uh, and the, the deity of Christ and still do. Uh, as when I was younger, I, I looked at that passage and that passage really affected me for a long time. So that's a confession on my part. Uh, because Good. I think a lot of people, uh, <laughs> yes, I, I mean, I think we, we should struggle to, to try and take scripture for what it means. But uh, so that passage was a surprising one for me, Carlos, back then. But today that passage is surprising for a different reason. It's surprising to me because we believe Jesus is man. Luke says that he grew in wisdom. That is to say that the person of Christ is growing in wisdom, right? So when it comes to Jesus saying the son knows not the hour, what is surprising to me now is why we are surprised at that. I mean, he's man, right? The man has chosen, uh, or rather the person of Christ has chosen to submit his knowledge uh, to the will of his father so that he knows what the father enables him to know. That is not a denial of the deity of Christ, where he does know things uh, that human beings don't know. For example, he knows the hearts of men, but it's just a demonstration of Philippians 2, where he willingly submits to the Father. But that didn't answer your question. Your question was, are we talking about the who is speaking when Jesus yes. says, well, I... Let, I, yeah, I, let I me, okay, sure. Maybe let you, me I, I will, can I just, could, if you give me five seconds, I'll answer that question. Sure. Right? Is that okay? Yeah, so who is speaking? Is it Jesus speak? Is, is the human nature speaking or the divine nature speaking? The divine nature and the human nature don't speak. The person speaks, the person who is truly man and truly God speaks. Sorry, Carlos, please follow up. No, that, that's all right. So, no, it's on the same vein, on the same uh, text. So now I'm curious how uh, a text like Mark 13, 32, mm -hmm. so how would you fit that into the, the communication of properties you just explained? In other words, mm -hmm. so neither the son nor nor the the man jesus so they're speaking as one whole person here right so the son doesn't know or the or the human nature doesn't know it, it am i uh, I'm, I'm struggling to ask this question I, so I, how I, I, I see that <laughs> yeah I see that. I see that you're struggling too. But I also want to say, I want to commend you for, for at least to me, uh, that it seems that your your, your questions um, 
uh, you're not asking gotcha questions, but you're asking the way you're phrasing them is essentially right. to try and understand this. And I really yep. appreciate that, Carlos. So uh, to answer that question, the, the key thing, uh, and, and I'm sharing this not from a debate perspective to win a debate. I'm sharing this as someone who studies the scripture and wants to not be right, but to know what is right uh, by the scripture. And it is to just plainly take Carlos, whatever scripture says. And so to me, the issue here is the scripture says I, it, it, the I cannot be divided into human or divine natures. It's I, it's, it's a person speaking. However, the scriptures also teach, as we pointed out in Colossians 2.9, that in him, the fullness of deity dwells bodily. The scriptures also teach that he chose in Philippians 2 to do this. So I'm what I'm doing, Carlos, is here. I'm explaining to you how I come, my, come to my answer. It is basically by allowing all of scripture to speak and to just say that the person of Jesus is man, he is God. But the moment we start cutting down in between Carlos and saying, is this a human, human nature speaking or is it a divine nature speaking? We are we are basically and going to end up with a schizophrenic Jesus. And I, we right. can't do that. We just got to allow Jesus to be who Jesus, the Bible says he is. He is right. God. The Bible teaches that he is man. And at the same time, he is one person. And that it may not directly answer your question, Carlos, but right. that's how we well, wrestle with it from an no, honest answer. Yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate the candor and honesty. Um, yeah, I'm trying to, I, I really am trying to understand because the communication of properties, as you described it, says that what is true of the, of the nature, of the divine nature is true of the human nature. So yes. I'm just, uh, I'll leave that as a question for the audience so, so I can move on here. Um, let me ask you about, <laughs> okay, Philippians 2 obviously is very important in this with this topic as as you presented in your opening. So let me let me see if again this is I'm really trying to to understand and through me yes. hopefully yeah. the audience can also you know in their own come to their own understanding. So Philippians 2 uh, says things like he did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. He was in the form of a slave. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. He was exalted by God. My question is, is this passage describing the human nature only? Or I, I, I think I know your answer because you hold to the communication of properties. So is this describing you know, the son as well is, is the question. So did the son consider himself not equal with God? The son was in the form of a slave. The son humbled himself. You, you know what I mean? No, absolutely. It's such a good question. Um, and uh, yeah, so, and, and to go back to the text, the text doesn't say, just a slight correction, that the text doesn't say that the son did not, uh, did not, uh, I don't know how you phrased it just now, but I disagree with the way that you phrased it. Well, uh, well the, if I may, what's true, yeah, sure. of, what's true of the human nature is true of the divine nature. Yes, I agree with that. Yes. Right. So I, I'm talking about Paul, Philippians too. Right. So when Paul says he did not consider equality with God, he was in the form of, of a slave. He humbled himself. He was exalted by God or super exalted as the Greek reads there. Yes. He emptied himself. So if, if how, how do you explain that in light of the communication sure. of properties for the divine? Yeah. Sure. And so, yeah, the, the phrase that you said that I was saying that I, I, I would disagree with the way it's phrased is that he did not consider equality with God. Uh, whereas the text in the, in the fully says did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, which means that, uh, that he did not cling on to it. He let it go. And so my, my the way that I would understand this, Carlos, uh, and I think that it's just a plain reading, is that he is equal to God. He does not cling on. Now, bear in mind the context. I just taught, uh, I think last week in my church, I preached, I mean, I, I taught on Philippians chapter two uh, from Philippians chapter one. And so the whole thing is dealing about Christian submission. You know, the Philippian church was having a little bit of a squabble there between uh, a couple of women uh, in there. And so what is what is happening here is that Paul is saying that the way the Christian model is this, you must have this mind, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And he's talking to about how he's using this model to talk about how two equals 
in church should deal with one another just as two equals in heaven, uh, which is the Father and the Son, are, 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 you know, are, are, are acting. So Jesus is equal to God. It says he did not cling on to that equality, but emptied himself. Now, the emptying of himself is not kenosis where he ceases being God, but by taking on a human nature, or, or rather the, to use the phrase of the, the, the words of the text, by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man. And this is where, to answer directly your question, Carlos, I believe, number one, that the emptying of himself that did not considering equality, equality with God takes place prior to the incarnation, before he is born in the likeness of man. So that this is a willing decision by Jesus, who is equal to the Father. That's what the text is teaching. And now he has given, emptied himself. Now that he has emptied himself, verse 8, he is being found in human form. Now that he's done that, he's humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. And so your question is, is this speaking about the human nature or the divine nature? It is talking about the person of the Son, as you rightly said, idiom, idiomatum, uh, communication idiomatum, taking on this so that the one person is being obedient. The one person is dying on the cross. And so it is right to say that the second person of the Trinity died as Tertullian did and uh, as uh, as uh, Ignatius did. So, so God the Son died. Yes. God the Son was born. God the Son was hungry and so on. Got yes. Uh, one last question. I think I have time. So you you're a Trinitarian. You believe God is three persons in one nature, one essence, uh, correct? Yes, so, yes. Okay. So now, uh, and just for the last question, I'll put the chart back up. So now that the Son has two natures, human and divine, uh, how has this uh, not changed? The Godhead, your 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 conception of the one God Trinity, the Godhead. How how yeah, how's this not a change to the divine nature or essence, as you call it? No, I just want to say that that's such a good question because rarely in debates of uh, this topic, especially on the deity of Christ, do you actually get to deal with the issues that do matter. Uh, and I think that's a this is an issue that does matter. Is there a change that takes place in the and the, the, the nature that scripture itself calls immutable, unchanging. Uh, and if so, that contradicts scripture itself. No, and so I would say that, that there's no change because scripture says there is no change. There cannot be and there is no change in the divine essence or the divine substance or the divine nature. What we are simply seeing is an addition, not a modification of the divine nature as uh, the monophysites teach, as the Eutychianism teaches or the Apollinarians teach. But it is it is basically a addition where so this, an addition but no change. Addition, not modification. So the okay, not, not change. person takes on a human nature. Yes. Last one. Uh, I think I, I got one. Um, if so, uh, yes or no? Do you agree that the Trinity is three who's in one what? I've, I've heard Nabil Qureshi put it in that way. I always thought it was, um, you know, I mean, I, it, it's, I don't disagree with it, but it, it can be an oversimplification. Right, right. Because, because you don't believe, obviously, in, in three persons in one person. So, uh, so I, I, my don't, no, I don't is, believe in three persons in one person, yes. Right, right. Uh, so the question is, so the son has two natures, but it's one person. Yes. So if the Trinity is three persons in one nature, is the Son two what's in one who? If you follow my yes, my no, I, 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 again that again now now you it, it's I love the fact that you ask first. Do I do I consider uh, do, what do what my thoughts on whether he's three who's in one what? Because the fact is that I I think that's an oversimplification for this precise reason. Uh, and so thanks, Carlos, for helping. Uh, people realize why you know it's 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 helpful sometimes to phrase it in that way, but uh, taken sure. to its logical conclusion, it, it becomes you, you see the problem. But no, uh, good question. So does uh, is Jesus do what uh, in one who? Uh, again, that's an oversimplification. What we are simply saying is the two natures, which is the sum total of God and what it means to be truly man, are uh, basically united, not confused in the one person of Jesus Christ. That's simply what it means. So to say that God has one nature means that God is you know, all the divine attributes, God is love, God is truth, God, all of those things are now communicated 
to the person of Jesus. And at the same time, what is man is communicated to him. Now, God doesn't have a human nature. So one nature is what God is. God is one nature. So uh, again, I, 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 can realize, I can understand why people would struggle with that. Uh, to understand it, but it, it's actually basically, if you go back to my definition, uh, a nature is what something is. So Jesus is has two somethings. You know, he has a human nature, it's a divine nature. That's simply what we're talking about. Here. Once again, I just want to thank Carlos for yet a, another wonderful debate. Uh, I did have some problems, as you saw earlier on, but uh, I, I, I said this to Carlos before we started that I really enjoy um, engaging with him. And one of the reasons is that we, when especially when you get to the cross-examination and the discussions, I, I hope that our viewers have seen that, uh, at least on my part, I'm trying my best uh, to do what, with what the, deal directly with what the scripture says, not to dodge, not to win the debate, uh, not to try and argue for the sake of arguing. And I hope that, and I, I clearly see that in the cross-examination that Carlos's questions were not uh, meant to try and trip or, or you know to trap but a sincere attempt to try and understand the other side. And for that, I really want to express my gratitude uh, to Carlos and to our moderator as well for this wonderful debate. Now, I want to, my closing statement, go back to my opening statement, which I, I said that uh, I'm going to contend that the, the way that we're supposed to understand this debate uh, is the question of whether or not God can become man. And I have demonstrated all throughout that God not only can, but that God did 2,000 years ago in the person of Jesus Christ. That is why the virgin birth is so important. It's important because Jesus is not merely man. That's not all that he is. He is God who became flesh. And so uh, to summarize my argument, I presented one main contention that Jesus possesses two, divine, uh, two natures, a divine nature and a human nature. And I argued in four premises. Premise one, God possesses a divine nature. Uh, and so I, 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 I'm still convinced that Carlos agrees with me on that. And uh, number two, humans possess a human nature. Again, I'm convinced that Carlos agrees with me on that. Number three, Jesus is truly God. Uh, again, this is where Carlos and I would disagree. Hopefully not for too long. Uh, I will be praying for Carlos. Uh, and uh, But uh, the, the point is, that uh, all of the texts that I brought up for Jesus' deity were not engaged. And so I would say that we have, by the grace of God, sustained uh, this third point, that Jesus is truly God. Number four, Jesus is truly man. I, I don't think Carlos would disagree with this. I tried pressing him in the cross-examination to, 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 to state whether or not he agreed because I thought it would be a point of agreement. I, I'm, I'm convinced that he would agree that Jesus is truly man. And so when you put these four things together, the conclusion is that Jesus did possess two natures. He possesses a divine nature. He possesses a human nature. And that is why we go to Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, which says, In him, the one person, the fullness of deity, the whole fullness of deity, all of what it means to be God, dwells bodily. And this is why we believe in the doctrine of the two natures. Let me summer, conclude uh, by quoting uh, of the... Uh, uh, Pope Leo the Great is called Pope Leo, uh, Leo the First. Uh, he says, quote, as God does not change by his condescension, so man is not swallowed up by being exalted. Each nature exercises its own activity in communion with the other. The word does what is proper to the word. The flesh fulfills what is proper to the flesh. He is God in virtue of the fact in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He is man in virtue of the fact that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, he also goes on to say in that same document, to pay the debt of our sinful estate, a nature that was incapable of suffering was joined to one that could suffer. Thus in keeping with the healing that we needed, one and the same mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, was able to die in one nature and unable to die in the, in the, in the, other, in the other. He who is true God, was therefore born in the complete and perfect nature of a true man, whole in his own nature, whole in ours, invisible in his own nature, he became visible in ours, beyond our grasp, he came within, he, he chose to come within our grasp, existing before time began, he began to exist at a moment in time. This is the doctrine of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And so as I conclude with this, uh, I just want to uh, once again thank Carlos, uh, for this uh, really enlightening, enlightening debate. And I look forward to more engagements with Carlos in the future. Hopefully, another debate may be announced soon. Thank you so much. Note that the two natures model is a non sequitur. 
In other words, it gives you uh, a non sequitur proposition. Proposition one, only God can atone for your sins. And as a matter of fact, for the sins of the whole world. But then the proposition two is God cannot die, which is scripture. So, so that does not follow. That's what that's the non sequitur. I have to remind you that this two nature model represented by my opponent uh, bred or gave birth to the God man view of the historical Jesus. And this was, again, I have to remind you, this was codified, codified, made official doctrine, church doctrine, 400 plus years after our Lord Messiah was on earth, 451 AD. Actually, that's almost 500 years. So the Chalcedon Creed influenced the later so-called Athanasian Creed, which is the first in history to explicitly state a doctrine of the Trinity, that is, three persons in one nature or one substance. So that's why it's so important. The noted Anglican priest and historian of the early church, Leonard Hodgson, who was also Regis Professor of Divinity at the University of Oxford, uh, noted that the Athanasian Creed is a very instructive document for it shows that when an attempt was made to state this, the Christian faith in terms of the metaphysic of the time, all that could be done was to set down a series of contradictions and, and say that you would be damned if you did not believe them. This was not a Unitarian, non-Trinitarian Aryan. This is Leonard, Dr. Leonard Hodgson. Please check him out. The fact is that nowhere in scripture do we have a teaching of a so-called two natures of Christ. For the New Testament writers, Jesus was a man, which means a human person, period. Yet he wasn't some mere man, as many of my other opponents accuse us of. But no, he was the uniquely procreated son of God, who Paul later calls the last Adam. Now, this ties into one of the most prominent New Testament teachings that shows that the whole human person of the son suffered and died for your sins, for my sins, for all time. First John 4.10, it says, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Romans 5.10, I already quoted, God, uh, Paul believed that the son of God died for him. And if the person of the son did not really suffer, let alone die for us, then God did not raise his son from the dead. As we know, the Christian hope is to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath, 1 Thessalonians 1.10. The inevitable implications of this two-nature model would mean that atonement for sins has not been made, and thus we die in our sins. So Christians would have nothing to preach about as well. And however you want to define death, the Bible says God cannot do it. 1 Timothy 1.17. As I already quoted, the only God, the eternal King, the unseen one. So I would please ask you to hear the words of Matthew and Luke, not the words of Ignatius, not the words of uh, the, 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 the popes, the early Catholic popes, but the words of Paul, the words of Matthew, the words of Luke. They believed in the one human person of the Son of God uniquely procreated and he atoned for your sins and he really did die and suffer a horrible death so i thank you once again sam and tracy for this time thank you gentlemen all right so we're gonna begin our q and a time now and we'll have approximately 15 minutes for this. As I mentioned, if you have questions, put them in all caps. And if you are writing them at the last minutes, we probably won't get to them. And I will try to get to at least uh, one of each person's before I start in uh, doubling up on what people have asked multiple questions. So 
let's see here. And gentlemen, too, if you would please keep your answers to a minute or two so that we can get through more questions. And then the whoever it's addressed to, the other person will be able to respond um, as well. So let's find our first question here. Uh, let's see, this one is going to be for both of you gentlemen. So, um, read 1 Corinthians 2, 8, since the Lord of glory is a title reserved for Yahweh in Isaiah 6, and crucifixion is done to men, isn't Paul indicating Jesus is God and man? Um, Carlos, do you want to start with that? Yes. So, yes, uh, Jesus has many titles uh, that are also used for God. So he's obviously Lord. So the Lord is a title used for humans and God. Uh, so he's also the Lord of glory. And if you read the passage uh, there in 1 Corinthians 2, uh, it says, if they had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Actually, it's, it's the same verse. Think about that crucified was God really crucified? Again, it goes back to the fact that, you know, the, the, there was an early heresy that, that Sam knows very well called patri, patripatianism, that, the, that God the Father literally suffered and died. And that was a heresy, and I'm not saying that's what uh, Sam believes. But we have to be careful, because if we're saying that if... If uh, the Son is also God, the only one God, the Almighty God, then it sounds like we're we're back to this type of heresy. So the the fact that the title Lord there is used, and that obviously the, our Messiah is glorious, as we are glorious, by the way, we also have a glory. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that he was somehow God who was crucified. And, and I, I also, in my opening, just as a quick reminder uh, uh, of the anti-Semitism in the early church because of this type of understanding by early Christians who were mostly not uh, Israelites, by the way. They were mostly Gentiles like you and me. And this led to, to the hatred of the Jews. Think about it. People were misled and, and thought that uh, people had actually killed God. So you, you can imagine what type of... of, of uh, okay, thank you, Carlos. Uh, Samuel. Thank, uh, yeah. Uh, so I just thanks uh, for that question. That is really, really um, a good question. And the simple answer is yes. Um, yes, the Lord of Glory is a title that is used uh, for Yahweh. And it's uh, the crucifixion is something that was done only a man can do. And so the immortal God took on mortality as Philippians chapter 2 pointed out and Jesus the person Jesus the second person of the Trinity died uh, in flesh and so uh, I think that again and but going back to Carlos's uh, response I, I again I, I'm not here to, I, I don't want to uh, criticize Carlos because I really really like Carlos and I think that he's a great person uh, but the point that I wanted to say is that his tradition blocks him from just being able to take scripture at face value. And this is what I was saying at the start. Can God become man? If the answer is yes, uh, then uh, you take 1 Corinthians 2, 8, and you can read it at face value. They would not have crucified a lot of glory if they knew it. And I think that's what I can do. Unfortunately, Carlos would not be able to do that. He would have to reinterpret it. All right. Thank you. Um, we're going to try to keep our answers shorter if we may, because... Uh... Samuel needs to leave in about 10 minutes. So, uh, hint, hint, Carlos and Samuel. Yep. yep. Sorry. <laughs> our, our next question here, because we would like to get to at least a few of them. The people sure. have questions for y'all and they, they sat through this. So, um, if Jesus, this is uh, to Samuel, if Jesus, God the Son, has two natures, how many natures does God the Father have? One nature. He did not become flesh, so he only has one nature, that is the divine nature. How's that for a short one? That is short. Great, Carlos. you have any short comment on that? Yep, I agree. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, thank you. So um, here's another one for Samuel here. Uh, you said that Jesus is one person because he uses the singular pronoun I. Why doesn't God using the singular pronoun I mean that God is one person? 
Well, because G and again, uh, this is the same question that Carlos asked me in the last debate. Uh, and I mentioned to him that there is one speaker that speaks on behalf of the triune God. And when he says I, that is sufficient to refer to the triune God. They speak in, in, in a united voice. Uh, and so that, that doesn't pose a problem whatsoever. Because again, I don't believe that all three of them are talking at the same time. I believe that the son reveals the father so that Jesus can say, I, we're talking about Jesus. If the father speaks and he says, I, he refers to the father. If Well, uh, the Holy Spirit would say in the book of Acts, set apart for me, uh, Paul and Barnabas. And so it's a singular pronoun as well. That doesn't negate the fact that God is three persons because scripture teaches that the father is God, the son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. They're not the same person. All right. Thank you. Yeah, um, if I may quickly add, mm -hmm. uh, some Trinitarians like to use the let us verses, Genesis 126. So let us uh, create man in our image. So if plural pronouns, which are only a few, what is it, three or four, the let us, if, if plural pronouns are always used by some Trinitarians, you haven't used it here, to prove that God is a plurality of persons, you have what is it, tens of thousands of singular, you know, nouns, pronouns, verbs. So why can they prove that God is one single, by the way, non-human person? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, here's another question. Who is Jesus's God that he refers to in John 20, 17? And why did he call the disciples his brothers in that verse if indeed he is their God? Samuel. Thank you. Thanks for the question. It's a good one. Who is Jesus as God? The Father. There's nothing wrong in God the Son calling God the Father God. I mean, he's not an atheist. Uh, Jesus is not an atheist. He believes in God. And at the same time, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6 to 8, you read that God the Father calls Jesus God as well. Does that mean that God the Father has his own God? Uh, again, we, 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 are, we are we are allowing all of Scripture to speak when we take up these two things and they don't contradict at all. But I love the second part of the question where you're saying, why did he, why did he call the disciples his brothers? Because he became flesh, because he took on humanity. And because of that, I have a mediator between God and man. That mediator is the man, Christ Jesus, who calls me his brother. What a great privilege the gospel gives. Okay. Thank you, Carlos. You have a short answer there. We're the brother of our big brother, the human Jesus, we're not the brother of God in any way, in a mysterious uh, way or in, in some other way. So he's our brother. To say God is your brother, again, uh, it's it's close to blasphemy in, in my ears to, to, to say that because obviously, you know, God does have brothers. And the other interesting thing is that, uh, so the son is not an atheist, but then if if you follow that that logic, then the Father who never has a God, the Spirit who never is said to have a God, then they're atheists, I guess. So. <laughs> okay, and uh, let's see. Yeah, there's a lot of comments on here, so it's kind of it's hard to sift through. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, so. I'm going to pull this question up. I want to keep it short, please. We've already gotten into this prior, so we don't have to dwell on it, because I still would like to get another question or two in. For Carlos, how do you take 1 Peter 4, 1, where Peter says that Jesus suffered in the flesh? Why the qualification? 1 Peter 4, 1, because he did. Uh, flesh in the Bible, uh, in the Bible, in the New Testament. So Paul uses flesh in a, I could say, metaphorical way to describe the fallen nature of humanity, let's say. So he says in Romans 8, for example, do not walk according to the flesh. Here, uh, obviously, it's just a synonym for the person of Jesus. Since Christ suffered in the flesh, you also arm yourselves with the same attitude. And also, uh, there's also the, the same term is used for us, too. We, we suffer in the flesh or we we uh, struggle in the flesh or something like that. So it's just another way to talk about yourself, I think. Okay, thank you. Uh, Samuel? Uh, yes. Uh, so let me pull up my, I'm pulling up the screen. Okay. So the question is, how do you take 
1 Peter 4 1, where Peter says that Jesus suffered in the flesh? I think that's a great question, Pablo, and that is the question to ask. Uh, why is it that it says in the flesh? Uh, as you know, the early church uh, heresies, one of them is Docetism, which denies that Jesus came in the flesh. Uh, Gnosticism denies in, in some parts, especially look at Valentinian Gnosticism, uh, that Jesus came in the flesh because the flesh is seen as evil. And so it's so important that scripture teaches us that Jesus not only died, but he died in the flesh. That is in taking on his human nature, the immortal God is able to die. But I love the second question as well. Can uh, to comment on the view of the communicatio idiomatum? Absolutely. Uh, and that means that the properties of what it means to be man is communicated to the person of Jesus Christ, the properties of God, obviously Jesus is God, is there as well. So that means you, it's not just sufficient to say that the human nature died, the divine nature didn't die. That's not what it means. It is the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ died in the flesh. And that's why I love the precision of what uh, the, the text is right there. Okay, and our last question here. Uh, so, Sammy, you said that, uh, and now again, that he died in the flesh. Um, what does that mean to you? That means he was able, the immortal God was able to die having taken on flesh in the incarnation. The word incarnation uh, is the taking on of flesh in the flesh. Uh, literally, incarnation is in carnes, in flesh. Uh, so that's that's what John 1, 1 says. Uh, the word, uh, and earlier it, it Carlos says to the Bible, uh, the Bible doesn't say that God became flesh. It says the word became flesh. Yes, right after saying the word was God. And so uh, the point is that God became flesh and that flesh, in the flesh, the immortal God was able to die. That's what I meant by that. Okay, Carlos. Uh... Yeah, again, uh, this just has no meaning that God died in the flesh. I mean, that, again, you, you have to go back to those early heresies and I'm sorry to bring that up, but that's what it sounds like. I mean, uh, the, we're brothers of God somehow. Uh, the text of just quickly in First uh, John, First uh, John four two. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus the Messiah as having come in the flesh is from God. That's just a synonym, synonym I should say, or a way of speaking of Christ as the person, the human person that he was. And uh, the, the failure to embrace the fact that the Son of God was a human person and not some second person of a divine nature that came, developed hundreds of years later, uh, is anathema in the New Testament. You, you have to understand that the human Son of God suffered and died. The human Son originated in the womb, was procreated by a miracle. And that's, I think, what, what 1 John 4 uh, two is saying. All right. Well, thank you. And I would, is it, I think we got done just in time, Samuel. For if I, if I, sorry, Trace, just a cheeky comment about uh, uh, Carlos saying that, uh, you know, that it's blasphemous. I, I agree that it appears that way. That's why Jesus was charged with blasphemy. Uh, but <laughs> I really enjoyed this. Thanks so much, Tracy. <laughs>